Welcome to MOOC course on Introduction to Proteogenomics. In the last lecture, Dr. Mani provided you an overview of using Protege software. Some of the features of Protege includes data normalization and filtering, data quality control checks, market selection, interactive visualization of results, integration of protein-protein interaction databases, as well as how to save your analysis sessions and then you can share with your colleague researchers and collaborators. And finally, how to export your results into some output files like Excel or PDF formats. In today's lecture, continuing from the previous session, Dr. Mani will talk about how to implement log to transformation, normalization, data filtering and selection of test using Protege. He will also discuss about the output summary and data visualization in Protege. He will finally show you how Protege can represent your results in multiple ways like PCA plots, scatter plot, volcano plots, etc. So, let us welcome Dr. Mani for today's session. I want to show you what it can do so that you can explore things either with the given data or if you are adventurous enough you can try with your uh, uh, own data. So, let us just go through. So, pick PAM 50 and then you will get the list of uh, uh, groups and how many samples are in each group and then click OK. Then you get to the main page of uh, uh, Prodigy where you can decide what you want to do to your data. So, the first column is log transformation. So, suppose you had only ratios and you did not log transform, then you can say I want to transform the data using log base 2 or log base 10. So, if you clicked on uh, the appropriate dot, it would transform your data. So, right now the data we have is already log 2 transformed. So, we need to leave it at none. You do not want to log transform, log transform data. So, what is the log of a negative number? It is not defined. So, half of your data will get thrown away if you try to log transform again because the once you have log transformed, the up regulated ones are positive, the down regulated ones are negative. If you try to log transform again, all the negative data will become missing because negative of a, the log of a negative number is not defined. So, you do not want to do that. So, then we discussed many different ways of normalizing. So, some of those are implemented here. So, if you pick median, it is just median centering, it will not scale. If you pick median mad, it will median center and mad scale. And if you pick two component, it will do the two component normalization that we uh, went through. And if you want quantile normalization, really you can also do it. But if you have data that has already been normalized, then you would pick none. So, in this case, the data set I provided is intentionally not normalized. So, you would want to normalize it. You could do two component if you want to see, but two component normalization takes a while. Each sample takes like a minute or so and we have like a hundred samples. So, it would take it would take like half an hour or so to do it. So, let us not try that, but median mad is a reasonable alternative. So, for this exercise we will use median mad. You can try two component later maybe in your in the evening or something like that. So, then this one has the data set has about 15,000 proteins that came out of spectrum L with basically very minimal filtering. So, if a protein was missing in 90 percent of the samples, it is still here. If a protein did not change in any of the samples, it is still here. So, you might want to consider implementing some kind of a filter. Ideally, what we do in our analysis is to have like a missing value filter where things that are missing in too many samples are excluded. Uh, here we do not have that filter, but a reasonable filter that I am going to use is called the standard deviation filter. What it does is it takes each protein, looks at the protein measurement across all the samples and calculates the standard deviation and says what is the value of the standard deviation. So, it ranks all the samples, all the proteins by standard deviation and keeps the ones that are, which do you want to keep? The ones that are most varying or least varying? I hear least, anyone votes for most? Least, everybody thinks we should keep the least varying proteins. 
So you have a protein that never changes in any of your subtypes. Would you want to keep that? No. You want to keep the proteins that are most varied because that's hopefully your marker. Your ideal marker is not present in one and is like high level in another one, another group. So that has a high standard deviation. So you want to keep things that are high, uh, uh, that vary more, high standard deviation. And here you can uh, pick what percentile of things you want to keep. So what fraction of things you want to keep. Just to make things fast, I'll pick 50. So usually 50 is a more aggressive number. You would pick like uh, throw away like the top, the, the bottom 10 percentile, but I'm throwing away the bottom 50 percentile. So this is just to make, have fewer um, uh, uh, proteins in the analysis, but you see you'll still have about 7,000 proteins in your analysis. Then the question is what kind of a test do you want to do? Do you want to do a one sample test, a two sample test, or a moderated, uh, or a F test? So here I'm going to pick two sample and then I'll tell you why. So if you pick two sample, we picked PAM50 as the uh, annotation and you want to compare some uh, one or two of your PAM50 classes, let's say. Then you would pick two sample and then to decide which two you want to compare, you click on select groups. So when you click on select groups, it will tell you all the comparisons that are possible given the annotation that you picked. So it says you can do basal versus HER2, basal versus luminal A, basal versus luminal B, and so on. So I'm just going to say I want to do basal versus luminal A, and I'll deselect all the others. You can do any number of these or all of these if you want, but the results will be more confusing and harder to interpret. But I'll, uh, you can pick which one you're looking at at any point. I'll just look at one. And when you do a display of the data as a heat map, it can show you annotation tracks so in, say you want to see which one was ER positive versus ER negative and so forth. You can keep that information and show it in plots if you want. So that's the annotation track selection. I'm going to remove things that are basically like very across every sample, like sample ID, experiment, TMT channel, again sample name, and QC status I'll remove. And just keep the the ERPR HER2 status and mutation status for the three genes that are there. So we can look at that. Then click update to make sure that the selection is registered and then close this. So now you are ready to run your analysis. Okay. So what is the data normalization? We pick median MAD now. So we can pick, pick um, median MAD again. Um, that was not supposed to happen, but I'm not sure. So let's just make sure the select groups is still there. Yeah, that's there. So all the rest are fine. So just double check and then click run analysis. It will take like half a minute. It will tell you on the bottom what it's doing. So it's applying standard deviation filter now after normalization. And then it will do the two sample t-test and then you will get a page that shows results. So while we are waiting, I'll just keep talking on what, what you will get at the end of this. So at the end of this, you will get a, a screen with multiple, so actually it's going through, it's running the two sample test now. I think it's done. So here's the results now. So you'll get a page like this. The top of the page gives you a summary of the data. So you had 15,369 proteins and you had uh, five groups. So number of expression columns, so 50, so remember we had about 100 or 105 samples, I think, but we did a basal versus luminal A comparison. So the total number of basal and luminal samples together is 55. Then the workflow shows what uh, log scaling, what normalization, what filtering you used, and what test you ran. And so we filter the results to look at only things that are statistically significant after adjusting the p-value. And the p-value adjustment uh, is uh, Benjamin E. Hochberg FDR correction. That's the only one that we have, and that's, that's always applied. So the results are that there are 476 markers of basal, a versus, uh, of basal versus luminal A in the filtered data set um, that are statistically significant with an adjusted p-value of 0 0.05. So, so why are we 
Maybe you have changed your p-values, or you used a different normalization. No, no, maybe that's funny. I have the measure versus R2. Maybe if you can see the last one, the number of sin is given. Yeah, you could have used a different uh, uh, test or different groups. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. So the the bar plots here show how many proteins were observed in each of your samples. So this is like the number of proteins in this sample was about 12,000. The second sample had a little more and so on. And the red bars are for the basal samples and the green bars are for luminal samples. So suppose you looked at this and all the red bars were there and all the green bars were half the size. Then you would be very worried because there is some batch effect or some effect somewhere that consistently is observing fewer number of proteins in the luminal samples only. So this is basically like a QC check to kind of make sure that nothing is grossly wrong with your data. So this one shows how many missing values are there uh, in each of the samples. So there, there are about 8,000 proteins that are seen in every sample. All samples have these 8,000 proteins observed. About uh, fifty percent missing. So, uh, when when you take into account uh, proteins that have about fifty percent uh, missing, so they're not observed in fifty percent of the samples. Then there are totally about twelve thousand proteins that fall into ca that category, less than or equal to fifty percent missing. So this basically is to show. Uh, the uh, the r rate of missing values, uh, how many do you have on the, in the average uh, sample and how many are observed in all the samples. So it's just to make sure that, that there aren't too many missing values that you have. The other things you look at are there's a clustering tab which can generate a heat map. <clears throat> so this is a heat map. So you can see the annotation uh, bars on top. So red is basal, green is uh, luminal A. And then these are other annotations that you have on the side. I think my screen is too small to see those. Maybe you can see it. But I think these tracks are ERP or HER2 status. And you can see that um, <coughs> ERPR and HER2 are basically all negative in basal samples. Because generally, triple negative samples fall into the basal category. The other thing you notice here is that the black marks are missing values. Remember, we included missing values, and with the test that we do can actually handle missing values, so did, we did not fill in missing values. And so this display is showing which values are missing for each of the proteins. And these are all statistically significant proteins that are different between basal and luminal. You can see at the top that basically this line is almost a complete black line with one or two things here and there. So that is saying that that protein was present in only a couple of samples. And because they were reasonably different between the basal and luminal, the statistics is saying that was significant. Would you really believe it? I wouldn't. So this is a strong indication that you really need to filter to remove uh, proteins that are missing in too many samples. So if you did that, this would kind of get chopped off somewhere here. And after that, it's fine. You have missing values here and there, it's OK. But if your conclusion is made on two pro samples in one group and one sample in another group with all the rest missing, that's not what you want. So this, you can basically, by visually exploring your data, you can get a feel for what is happening, whether your analysis is reasonable or not. And you can constantly keep making uh, sanity and quality checks to make sure that your analysis is, uh, is reasonable and the results you are getting is reliable. So the other thing you can, so you can uh, play around with a lot of settings and things to make it look like you want. I won't do all those, but the other thing you want to look at are volcano plots. So are people here familiar with volcano plots? No, okay, it's a couple of them are. A volcano plot is a plot of fold change on the x-axis versus statistical significance or p-value on the y-axis. 
So, uh, on the x axis we have log fold change. So, if it is negative it is non regulated, if it is positive it is up regulated, but this is comparing basal versus luminal. So, basically if it is on the left side it is up in basal, if it is on the right side it is up in luminal and the, the farther away it is from the x axis the more statistically significant it is. So, p values decrease when they become more significant but we have multiplied it by negative sign. So, it goes up. So, it is visually uh, kind of impactful right. So, if it is far out on the top then it is a statistically significant uh, protein. So, anything that is the th beyond the threshold of 0.05 adjusted p value is marked in red. So, remember it said there were 400 something markers that were significant. You are seeing all those markers and you can see which ones are up in basal and which ones are up in lumina. And in this one if you go and click on it, it will tell you what marker it is. So, if you click there it will hopefully tell you. Huh? Oh, that is true sorry there. So, that that protein is uh, the gene is AGR 2 and the protein uh, ref seq ID is, is shown over there. <coughs> so, the um, if you look at the breast cancer paper, so we said P53 there are some there is some upregulation in basals and downregulation in luminal A. If you look at RB2 they are kind of similar in both basal and luminal A. So, we are comparing basal like and luminal A in this comparison. So, if you looked at P53 then it should be up in basal and kind of uh, down in luminal. Uh, similarly, with pic 3 ca and I think another protein that is known to be up in basals is EGFR. So, we can take a look at all those things uh, in, in here by doing the following. So, you go to protein protein interactions, click on the plus sign, deselect everything under source data and then type in the name of your protein. So, you want EGFR. So, it gives you the the protein with the gene name you click on it. If you go here you can see EGFR is way over there. It is statistically significant and it is up in basal like we expected. So, see so you, you can also try uh, can you do multiple no. So, the other thing you can do is TP 53. So, pick that you can see this is also up in basal, but is not as statistically significant as uh, EGFR. So, you can explore your proteins, you can kind of uh, export the list of statistically significant markers and look at it, you can do all kinds of things. The, there is export, so you can use that. And if you look at the table, you can see the actual values. So, these are the adjusted p values, the average expression, the log fold change all the information that you might want to include in your paper or you want to like include in import into some other software you want to look at are all here and you can export this as a table to look work on it. If you want to see how one sample plot uh, uh, if you want to see uh, a given protein you know, how it measures in one sample versus another you can do like a scatter plot. So, this is uh, this sample versus that sample and is showing all the proteins in that uh, measured in those two samples. So, you can see most of them are similar, some of them are more extreme. So, these are all like uh, uh, basically things to look at um, the, the data and kind of get a feel for what is happening. The other thing I want to show is PCA. So, when you do PCA you can see that is the plot you get and it is colored by basal versus luminal. So, you can see if you draw a vertical line it essentially separates basals from luminals that is saying that this is the most dominant signature in the data. But you can also see that there is one red dot in the middle of all the greens and one green dot in the middle of all the reds. So, there are two samples that kind of behave like the other group. So, what are these you might want to go and explore. So, in, in clustering also if you do a look at the heat map you may be able to see this, but here it is much more striking and now you can say ok what happened with those samples are they mislabeled what is the reason they are behaving like the other group 
So you might want to go and explore those. So I, these are all tools to kind of generate hypotheses so you can explore it more biologically and kind of build a biological story. It's not like this is going to build the story for you and write the paper, but this will give you tools to look at it from a biological perspective. And the tools are set up in such a way that people who don't do programming and who are primarily biologists or experimentalists can look at it. So that's kind of the whole point of Prodigy. So um, people who don't do R programming can actually use the results of other people's R programming. I think I will stop there. There are QC section has many plots. Actually, let's just look at box plots. So this will show you what happens after normalization. So on the left side is um, the box plot before normalization. On the right side are box plots after normalization. I think the screen is so small it's all squished. But you can see this sample was actually adjusted quite a bit to get to normalization, to, to agree with all the others. But the other samples were adjusted to a lesser degree. So you can get a feel for, are there samples that were, that you had to uh, use extreme uh, normalization factors to get them to uh, agree with all the others. In that case, you might want to see whether those samples had any issues or if there was uh, less material for that sample for whatever reason, or if those samples didn't just work out, they, they failed for some reason. If you can show that they failed for whatever reason, you can throw that out and uh, do your analysis. It will be more robust if there are less offending samples. But you shouldn't throw away samples simply to get a better result. But if there is a experimental reason why some sample failed, you can remove that sample and redo the analysis. Um, the thing that's about it, I'll stop there. If there are any quick questions, I'll answer. So here, the red and green were basal versus luminal A. CSV or Excel format, yeah. yeah. To make GCD files for. Yes. So if you have a, if you have an Excel file or a CSV file, you can go to Morpheus. So like I, so I it, it's actually come up here. So uh, if you go to Google and search for Morpheus Broad, you will get the website, and you can go to the software, which is called Morpheus. And you see there is select file or drag and drop file. You take your Excel file or CSV file and drop it in there. It will open it and show a heat map. And then you can save it as a GCT 1.3 file. You can add annotations using different files if you want. And then you can save it as a GCT file. And then use it in uh, Prodigy. Uh, you can also use CSV files directly in Prodigy. But when you load it, it's going to ask you to annotate the samples. So you have, it'll create a template, and then you have to fill the template with your annotation, and then load in the template. So for a hands-on, it was a little more complex. So we didn't do it, uh, but it's also possible. So you go to, once you do that, you'll get a top bar, which has like a menu. And then there will be a way to export the table. Yeah, you have to export the table, and it'll ask you what format, and you pick GCT 1.3. For Prodigy, so go to GitHub and search for Prodigy. You'll get Broad Institute Prodigy. Jump to. So there is a directory here called Docs. So there is an introduction. There is data formats, installation, and and some documentation there. And I think on the main page also, uh, there's some documentation on what all it supports. And in Prodigy itself, when you, I'm, I'm going to refresh. On the first page, it has the same information. But when you load a data set, it also tells you for each operation what it does and things like that. So uh, there is some documentation, but it, it, it's not like thermo documentation, because we are not paid like thermo. Yes, you need to sign in. You need an account to log into GitHub. It's free, but you have to sign in. I'm, I'm sure you have a lot of, lot more questions, and things were a little unclear. But the more you explore on your own, the more you'll remember what you discovered. I could give you step by step for everything, but uh, it'll stick less.
I hope the last two lectures and especially today's last session was very helpful for you to get a glimpse about how to use Prodigy software for analysis as well as visualization of your data. We also learned that Morpheus software can be used to prepare file with annotation which could be used in the Prodigy analysis. Apart from the annotation you can also visualize your data using heat maps or even explore the interactive tools like Morpheus. Variety of tools are available in Prodigy to really give you the visual glimpse of what is lying in your big OMEG data set. I hope these sessions are giving you not only the basic understanding of various concepts involved in looking at your data, but also providing you the open access tools where you can start implementing them right away from any data set available from databases or your own data set you can start analyzing them now. In the next lecture we will have a guest speaker Dr. Devashil Das who will talk about proteomics data analysis. Thank you.